Amen. Why don't we turn in our Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is where we started studying last week. And God willing, we're going to continue just working through the pastoral epistles. There are two, I should say, two chunks of Scripture I've read more than any other. The Proverbs I have probably read more than any other book in the Bible. I've probably read through the Proverbs, I wouldn't say hundreds of times, but I've read the Proverbs easily 200 times. And then number two on that list would be Timothy, Timothy, and Titus. Those books I've read over and over and over again because as a pastor, these describe my job description. They are called the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, because they are written by the Apostle Paul to the active pastor, that is Timothy at Ephesus, or Titus, who is at Crete. We also see something poignant that modern church governments would be well to observe, and that is congregations did not vote on Timothy to be their pastor, nor did the congregation of Crete vote on Titus to be their pastor. They were appointed by someone greater than them. Someone greater than Timothy appointed Timothy. Someone greater than Titus appointed Titus. I don't, well, I do know. I would say, I don't know how we got here. I do know the congregational style government happens to coincide with the birth of our nation and a democratic republic where we think, you know, if everybody's voting a certain direction, that's good, right? Because majority rules, right? Well, every election, everybody who loses doesn't think the po folks who voted in the majority were smart. And truthfully, if you were to let the church in the wilderness of Israel vote, they would have all voted to go home to Egypt and be slaves again. So who in the world thought letting God's people vote would be a good idea for anything? And I do like to point out, nowhere in the New Testament do you see voting of any kind. You don't see it. You see what's called executive chain of command, executive authority, appointing people under them to positions of hierarchy. And I, I'm sorry if you're a little woke, but the world runs on hierarchies. We're not equal. They're not a one of us equal. Now, we have equal protections under the law. We have equal rights under the law, but we still ain't equal. Many of you are way better than me at many things. But in this church, there's nobody equal to me. At my pastor's church, I'm not equal to him. At Pastor Scott's church, I'm not equal to him. In my home, nobody's equal to me. In your home, there's no one equal to you. So we got to get that through our little woke skull, that, that kind of, I don't know, aromas being propagated. Everybody believes we're equal, 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 equal. I like what somebody said. If we really want uh, to lose misogyny and drop that sexist, anti-woman inequality, we should empty out about a half million men from prison and put a half million women in there. <laughs> Just so that we have all things equal. How come it only works one way? So we're in 1 Timothy, and we saw some pretty strong things last week. We looked at the fact that Paul is addressing the Jewish habit in that day of relying more heavily on the oral Torah than the written Torah. When he said in verse 4, don't give heed to fables, which is an important part of the oral Torah. And he said, uh, or endless genealogies, which is also an important part of the oral Torah when you're chasing the authority of who said what. And if you read through the Midrash of the Talmud, uh, you'll find out that nobody ever speaks under their own authority. They always quote about two, three, or four people in their lineage. It would be like me saying, Pastor Vaughn said that Brother Hagin said that Lester Sumrall said that Smith Wigglesworth said that Howard Carter said faith moves God. Wow, it took a long time just to spit it out. That's an endless genealogy. And we also saw where the law was given, not for the righteous, but for those that are wicked. And we looked at a lot of things. Uh, verse 12, Paul talked about he was thankful that Christ Jesus had counted him faithful, putting him in the ministry. If the Lord hasn't put you in the ministry yet, the reason's easy. He hasn't found you faithful where you are yet. There's no other way to shake this thing out. If you're getting antsy, just be more faithful and recognize you still need to learn everything he has you learning wherever you're learning. And if he never calls you up from the minor leagues, be content. 
Just be content because that's a Bible commandment too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That verse would also fulfill the gospel where it says many are called, but few are chosen. We don't worship callings. Can you imagine the lunacy of having an invitation to the White House to go meet with whoever your president is or whoever you don't like, but still to be invited is an honor. And you just go around telling everybody, look at my calling, look at my calling, look at my invitation, look at my invitation, look at my, look at my invitation, look at my invitation, look at my invitation. And it begins to develop dirty fingerprints from always going around talking about your invitation and your calling. I've been called to the White House. I've been called to the White House. I got to Instagram it, got to TikTok it, got to Facebook it, got to tweet it, whatever. And yet you never answer the calling. Well, have you, have you RSVP'd? Why would I do that? I just want to walk around and talk about how important I am because I got a letter. Well, at some point, you answer the calling or you die. And most, I think the reason the Lord has to call many because he knows very few will answer. I think he's working statistics. Amen. And then that kind of brought us to the end here. Uh, let's just pick up in verse 18 and then charge into chapter 2 because chapter 2 is going to give us a greater importance of the end of chapter 1. Verse 18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. We said, he's reminding Timothy, you've got all those prophecies, and by them you war a good warfare. Let's stop and say this again. We are a Pentecostal church. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe in prophecies but not the way modern prophecies are viewed. If we were to view prophecies biblically, what that tells us is that prophecies will bring warfare and prophecies are necessary to win warfare. What we've turned prophecies into in the last 60 years of charismatica is a feel good, bless me word. I'm not really interested in a prophecy. I have a more sure word of prophecy called the Bible, but if God wants to give me one, I'm responsible for writing it down and praying it out and judging it, whether it's even the Word of God or not. I have a whole journal of prophecies from probably the middle 10 years of my walk with Christ. And out of those, we'll say there's 35 prophecies. That's arbitrary. Out of those 35 prophecies, we'll say 30, maybe five of them have proven to be the Word of the Lord. One sixth. It's not a very high percentage. But I used to pray all of them all the time. And this is what I would encourage you to do. I would encourage you to write down any prophecy you ever receive. <clears throat> Maybe go back, get the recording so you can write it down. And I would encourage you to pray them on a regular basis. And in the process of praying them, you'll know by the Spirit of God on the inside, was, was that really the word of the Lord or was that just a thoughtful prayer? And the more you pray it, the more you realize, I don't need to be praying this. this is just, and you'll just scrub it. You'll scrub it out of your prayer journal or your prophecy journal and you'll realize that that's not God. That was a guest minister praying. Maybe that was pastor praying and maybe we took it as prophecy or maybe we just missed God. But regardless, it's your responsibility to be able to judge the prophecy. And if you'll do something with it and realize there's a burden of responsibility with the prophecy, you won't run to the prayer line just to get a prophecy. I remember the first time Dr. Barclay ever laid hands on me, on me and prayed for me it was in March of 2000. And, and there was a long, it was a long prophecy. A lot of it was word of knowledge. But then he said, I put my hand on you to make money and not cheat God. At that time, I was struggling financially because I was making next to no money as a baby geologist. May he make money and not cheat God. <clears throat> And as God is my witness, he prophesied that and my money dried up for like six weeks. And if it wasn't for a massive piggy bank with dollar bills and quarters, I would not have been able to make ends meet. And I, all I could do was laugh and say, it's because that prophet prophesied, make money and don't cheat God. And I was paying bills and putting gas in my car out of a piggy bank, big glass jar. I wish he hadn't prophesied it over me. Make money, not cheat God. Cheat God, hallelujah, I'm getting a raise tomorrow. No, no, you're going to hurt tomorrow. And the next day, and the next day. But things did turn, and then money began to increase, and I began to get promotions in my career. But it was a very lean season, and I have no doubt it was because of the word of the Lord. If you understand the implication of prophecy, you wouldn't be like a little Madame Cleo chaser wanting a prophetic word that is really nothing more than soothsaying. You realize if the man of God is going to speak over you, it could mean attack. 
And if you know that, you say, no, 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 no. Just keep it to yourself. Just lay a hand on me and say, bless them, Lord. Whatever you think you got, just let the Lord talk to me at home about it. The devil doesn't need to hear it. We both have the spirit of the Lord. He can talk to me on the way home. Let that anointing come on me and let it minister to me quietly. But you know, in our circles, people become little greedy pigs for some prophetic word, usually because they need some encouragement because they don't walk with God Monday to Saturday. Amen. So by these prophecies that go on before thee, that you might as war a good warfare. And that's what we have to recognize is these prophecies are good for warfare. If you want to just collect them and throw them on yourself and feel good about yourself, they probably weren't genuine prophecies. Now, there is the simple gift of prophecy, which is edification, exhortation, and comfort. And that's a very simple gift of prophecy, but it's not the deeper gift of prophecy. The simple gift of prophecy is, my child, I love you. Don't quit. You're going to make it. It's really just reciting scripture. Yeah. Oh, there is honestly a point where you grow out of needing that. And I'm not here to put you down if you still need that. But at some point, you don't need the simple gift of prophecy. You prophesy over yourself. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul, hope in God? Get up. Praise him. I shall yet praise him, for he is the help of my hope of my countenance, the strength of my countenance. Put on a worship CD and shout the victory and praise him. Give an offering away to somebody to just kick the devil in the head. I mean, I don't need your simple gift of prophecy. Keep that to yourself. Go give it to the babies. I don't need it. How are you doing? I'm battle hardened. How do you think I'm doing? Get out of my way. <laughs> sure beats that mopey, depressed mode people love to milk on social media with. <laughs> Verse 19, holding faith. Well, because some people let it go. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. And we certainly are observing a day when people are shipwrecked concerning their faith. They're just quitting. They're just giving up. Churches are shrinking. I think the statistic I just read, I'm editing a book for uh, a Church of God bishop in New Jersey, which we're honored that he wants me to edit his book because our little thing is growing. He's got a book on leadership or mentorship, and he's got a bunch of statistics in there I was looking through, and uh, I didn't see the citation, but currently seven, his book says 1,700 churches a year are closing, which means either the preacher is falling into sin or being so discouraged he quits, or the, the churches are draining people because either they're going to the big easy church, and I wouldn't go ever, ever choose the big easy church. Or they're just shipwrecking. Very few churches are actually growing anymore because we're in a state of declension. The church is shrinking to some degree, and the nation is not any more church than it was 30 years ago. Folks are putting away faith, and they're putting away a good conscience. They're searing their conscience, and, and they're uh, concerning the faith. They are shipwrecking their own faith. Uh, Josh, pull that up, First Timothy chapter 1. Let's pull up shipwreck there in the New Living Translation, chapter 19. And let's look at that uh, and just keep New Living Translation ready because we'll, that'll be our go-to tonight. I'm going to read this to you in verse 19 and Schmidt will get it there for you in a minute. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. That's a pretty good command. Cling to your faith and keep your conscience clear. How do I keep my conscience clear? Repent when, it, when it's pricked. Even if you don't need to repent, if you think you need to repent, there's no harm in repenting. Lord, forgive me. I shouldn't have looked at that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have thought that. Keep your conscience clear. Don't let it get clogged. And keep your conscience clear. For, for some people to have deliberately violated their consciences. And as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. Let us never deliberately violate our conscience. If you know it's wrong, curse it to hell and move on. Don't try to exploit the mercy and grace of your God. Never say in your heart, and we all have, I'll just repent later. I'll just enjoy this for now. I'll get right with God later. Never let that be in your mind. Cast that thought down. We serve God. We serve him with everything we've got. So he says, as a result, they've shipwrecked their faith. Verse 20, I'm going to jump back between King James and NLT. 
of whom, because now he's, what I, I see when I read Paul's epistle here, I see him drawing upon personal experience. I see the Holy Ghost using all Paul's experiences and all of his ministerial interactions as he teaches young Timothy. So he's thinking about people who've shipwrecked. They've violated their conscience and have shipwrecked their faith. That's why verse 20 says, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus. He's warning Timothy because he doesn't want Timothy to end up like his two friends and Philetus. You can see his burden. He's like, I, I can't lose a son like I lost these two men. Now, we'll look at Hymenius and Philetus here in a minute, but both of these guys were ministry partners with Paul. Okay, what's it like to minister the gospel in the early days of pioneering and you lose two men that you yourself, through your apostolic authority, have to deliver them to Satan that they learn not to blaspheme? That's apostolic authority that you don't just cut fellowship with former preaching buddies. You turn them over to Satan because what they're doing is not sinful in the body. It's sinful concerning doctrine. It's a theological sin. We know the Corinthian fornicator who was having sex with a stepmom. He's turned over to Satan by the whole church because of fornication. That's not these men's sin. These men's sin is a theological heresy. But if you, if you don't keep your conscience clear, you could go either way. You could become a heretic or a pervert. Sin with your body or sin with your doctrine and hurt the faith of many. Either way, somebody's going to be commanded of God to deliver you to Satan. And what does that look like? Well, as the best I can tell, and the Lord's only had me do it to two people, it's where you basically get the devil's attention. And you in the spirit through prayer say, Satan... I'm no longer pl praying for Joe Dean. That's my new redneck lady, Joe Dean. I like it because it fits up for Cumberland, don't it? <laughs> I know, Lord, devil, I want you to know I'm no longer Joe Dean's pastor. Joe Dean has violated all my teaching and the rebuke of me in private and the elders and a public rebuke. Satan, Joe Dean is now yours. I will no longer pray for her. You have all rights and privileges to her life. You may now destroy her. And then you tell the church, church, do what you want, but the Lord has instructed me to stop praying for Joe Dean. She now belongs to Satan. Now, why would you do that? Well, number one, because it's biblical. But number two, if we keep praying for Joe Dean and she's already proven that she doesn't want to repent, we'll keep her alive and she risks clogging her conscience so bad she turns from the faith, which becomes the topic of chapter four. But if we turn her over to Satan and Satan begins to destroy her life, she might be humbled and say, help. She won't say help enough. I'm rebuking her. She's not saying help when the elders are rebuking her. Maybe if we as a church can stop aiding and abetting and enabling her and let Satan have her, let, her, let him put her in a bed of sickness, let him destroy her friendships, then she might say, I had it so much better when I served my God. And what we're describing is a biblical action called church discipline. It's the extreme one we have. Excommunication is not the most extreme one we have. Delivering someone to Satan for their death, that's the most extreme form we have of church judgment. Paul just didn't command the Corinthians to do it for some nameless fornicator who the whole church knew it was, but he also did it for fellow preaching buddies. I've never been told by God to do it to a preaching buddy. I don't think I have that authority. I have done it to a church member and I did it to a roommate in college. You just quit praying for somebody. That, of course, assumes you were praying for them to begin with. He says, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So this has got to be hard on Paul's heart. If we want to look at Hymenius and maybe understand some of the what's going on in the doctrine, go with me to 2 Timothy. He briefly mentions Hymenius here, and we can see insight into the sin being committed. We have to assume that Alexander is part and parcel of this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17. Or verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their worm will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus. So here we see Hymenius mentioned, and his words are considered to be cancerous. Who, concerning the truth, have erred? saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Why have they been delivered to Satan? 
because they began to teach the resurrection was past and they were hurting the Christian faith of saints. That's when you begin to deliver people to Satan. Now, we are such, I would say, hypocrites in the kingdom, the American church anyway, because we don't want the pastor to call out heretics from the pulpit because we think that's unloving, and yet you will gossip at home. You get upset if I say Joel Osteen doesn't know how to exegete his last name, or Rick Warren is a heretic, or Bill Hybels was a pervert. That'll upset you, but you'll go home and gossip and slander me. When I have biblical precedent for exposing error, Paul calls out Hymenius and Philetus forever. And here we are still talking about those idiots and their sin that earned them a hand, a hand given ticket, an invitation to Satan's school of theology. I don't want to ever learn how not to do something from Satan. Paul calls this guy's name out, both of them, and says they're heretics. They teach that the resurrection is past and they're overthrowing people's faith. And that explains to us why he's delivered them to Satan so they learn not to blaspheme. But that means they were preaching buddies because they understood the resurrection of the dead. That's a New Testament doctrine that Paul was expounding upon. There's some kind of relationship here that we don't know because the scriptures don't reveal it, but he wouldn't have authority over somebody he didn't know. If you jump back to Acts chapter 19, you see Alexander mentioned there. You see Alexander mentioned at Ephesus when Paul's having revival. Exodus, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 19, verse 22, the end of it says, Paul himself stayed in Asia for a season. And at the same time, there arose no small stir about that way, or that is Christianity. The way, that way. That's what it was called in the early days, the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, which was a Greek goddess, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, which is where Paul was, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. That's a little generous. I don't think all the world worship Diana, but, you know, that's how you sell your craft. <laughs> these guys were great marketeers. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Erasticus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel. So these are Paul's preaching buddies. They rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. So Paul hears his traveling buddies have been kidnapped by this mob and brought into the Ephesian theater, which is kind of like the public forum. Paul wants to go help them. And the disciples who know Ephesus better than Paul sa does say, no, we can't risk losing you too. Verse 31, and certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, that is, Paul made some high friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. So these chief men of Asia said, don't go there. It's not safe. Stay away, Paul. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the, uh, the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. So most of the folks there, like probably BLM, Summer of Love, we don't even know what we're doing here. Let's just throw a brick. Speaking of BLM Summer of Love, since we're entering into the third anniversary of it, I love what my friend Pastor Matt Krachunis pointed out. During the BLM Summer of Love, you know, three years ago when we were supposed to be on lockdown, but you could protest. You, you couldn't assemble to worship God, but you could assemble to burn down a city. That wasn't a demon. So Pastor Krachunis, you know, his church is meeting illegally. And he said... <laughs> Since the city of Seattle and the city of Auburn has declared that you can only assemble to protest, come Sunday morning, we're going to protest sin. Bring your own brick. <laughs> I 
Amen. You know it was a demon when we burned down innocent businesses in the name of justice. It's a demon. And if you thought it was a move of God or some kind of awakening, you don't walk with God and you didn't then. Amen. And if it bothers you that I don't have the right skin color to talk about it, you're fellowshipping with that spirit again. Like I pointed out Sunday, last, last week was the BLM's 10-year anniversary. You didn't hear anything about it because everybody realized they just ripped people off for $100 million. Remember when everybody was bending the knee, kissing the ring, dropping $5 million, $10 million because we got to earn some social credit and none of that money went to help inner cities? And blacks are still killing blacks at the same rate they were three years ago when we were supposed to have a revival. I, don't be offended that I point out the hypocrisy of Marxism. Okay. So this is that crowd. Most people, they don't even know why we're here. They're confused. The more part knew not why they were come together. What are we burning this city down for? And they drew Alexander out of the multitude. Remember, that's who Timothy said I had to deliver. They drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with his hand and would have made his defense unto the people. The Jews recognized that Alexander is part of Paul's company. You tell him. I was like, oh, okay. Um, so here Alexander is risking his life to defend the gospel and address this mob. Mobs haven't changed. They're all demonized. But when they knew that he was a Jew, so obviously he's a convert, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. For two hours, this mob chants about a demon. Say his name. Say her name. Say her name. Remember when we did that? Of course, we didn't because we worship Jesus. Remember when they, they taught the woke crowds to say her name, though that was a Yoruba Demonism practice of encanting the spirits of the dead gone by? Yes, Say his name. Say your name. And they admitted as much. Bringing an African juju into a social justice movement. Maybe we're talking about it because we're in an election cycle again. And when you need votes, burn a city. I, let me just ask this question. We have more cameras now than ever before. How come we haven't seen any more beatings? or shootings, though every week in Chicago, 40 blacks are killed or shot. Just like it was last weekend, like it'll be next weekend, and nobody seems to care. Except the mamas losing babies. I don't know why we're talking about this. I really just want to exegete, but maybe that spirit's flaring up, or maybe somebody here is fellowshipping with that spirit. I don't know. It's not your fault that you're the color you are. It's not my fault I'm the color I am. But whether I serve Jesus or not, that is my problem. So I just want you to see that's where Alexander is from. He shows this bold faith in the face of a crowd who is upset about their goddess losing attention. He's risking his life. But now some years later, Paul's having to deliver him in cahoots with Hymenius for apparently what appears to be heresy. And it, it hurts my heart because I can hear Paul's heart. Timothy, my son, cling to your faith. Listen to the prophecies. Don't shipwreck yourself like my other friends did. And then chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. Why, why the transition? I exhort, therefore. I demand, therefore. I command, therefore. I, my personal opinion, reading this and hearing the flow of Paul, is I wonder, let's put it that way, I wonder if Paul isn't thinking, I should have prayed more for my friends. He says, I, therefore. So, okay, what, what are you saying it, therefore? What's it, therefore? We just came out of a discussion about being clean and holy and finishing your race and clinging to your faith. And you just got done talking about two friends you had to deliver to Satan so they'd learn not to blaspheme. And now he says, let's pray more. Pray for those in authority, for all that are in authority, all men, not just the preachers that he's lost, 
But for kings, verse 2, and for all that are in authority, that would include apostles and preachers, pray for them that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. I, I see in this flow of thought here coming out of the heart of the Apostle Paul, anointed by the Holy Ghost, inspired by the Holy Ghost, Paul is, is drawing upon all of his experiences and seeing former ministers who would risk life and limb for the gospel now somehow be perverted and turn people away from the truth. And Paul having to deliver his former preacher buddies to Satan. And he doesn't want to see the same thing happen to Timothy. And so then he transitions. Chapter 2 picks up. I exhort, therefore, let's not stop praying for everybody in charge. We need people who are in charge to be holy. We need them to be clean. We ought to pray for our president, whoever he is right now, because I don't think it's Biden. And we need to pray for whoever it's going to be, because I don't think it's going to be Biden. God have mercy if it's Trump. We got to pray. I don't like this verse. I probably haven't the last five elections. But I still have to pray for the king. But one thing's true. We're not Canadian. Praise God. I don't have to pray for Trudeau. That would be even harder. At least Biden doesn't know what he's doing. Trudeau does. We're to give prayer. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks. Give thanks for our politicians? If you figure out how that works today, let me know and we'll teach it. How about just intercede? How about just pray for them? Lord, surround them with wisdom. Expose corruption. May it be brought to justice. May we actually have justice in the White House. But Paul also points out the reason we need to pray for everybody in authority is that because as it goes, so it goes for us. Proverbs says, when the righteous rule, there's great glory. When the righteous are in charge, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people mourn. And we need to pray for righteous leadership so we can have peace. When righteous people are in charge, it's easier to get people born again. It's no mistake everybody's flocking Democrat-controlled, liberal-run cities. It shows you that those policies are destructive and demonic. And where are they flocking? They're flocking to the states Hollywood spent the last 30 years making fun of. And when you run into those people who are blue state refugees, they always say, we absolutely love it here. Even in my dealings with the police, we have police who are moving from their cities to safer states moving to where they're respected. And they say this, most of the people here, when you pull them over or have to deal with them, they're polite. One officer told me, my dealings with your college kids, they're apologetic for getting in trouble. I said, welcome to the South. There's still morality here. Amen. When you have righteous leadership and righteous people in charge, there's a peace that comes upon the land. And that's why we need to pray. We need to pray that we may live quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Let me back up verse 2. You see the word all. Chapter, I mean, chapter 2, verse 1, you see the end be made for all. So there's all. Does that exclude anybody? Nope. And then chapter, uh, verse 2, for king and for all. Verse 3 now, so we have all twice. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. God, our Savior, who will have all. Well, if he wants us to pray for all who are in charge, and if he wants us to make intercession for all men, and if he wants all people to be saved, then I think all means all, and we don't have to prep, play a, or pull a President Clinton and ask what the definition of of is. What does all mean? I mean, all is all. He's my all in all, and he wants all to be saved. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? When we pray for righteous leadership, it allows people to be saved easier because there's an atmosphere. There's a, a spirit of peace, a spirit of righteousness. There's not the resistance of demons. There's not the destruction of demons. There's not the blinding of demons. Uh, when you drive through some of our major Christian cities, you can feel the presence of God because righteousness prevails there. 
They do have their sin. They do have their crime. They do have their demons. But it's, listen, there's a big difference between a San Francisco and a Tulsa, Oklahoma. I haven't been to Tulsa in probably eight years, but the last time I was in Tulsa, you could feel the presence of God in the city because it is a tremendous Christian Mecca. You don't feel that in San Francisco. I, I was in San Francisco 20 years ago, didn't feel God at all in 20 years ago, and much less now. When God is able to prevail through the people, it allows things to change. It allows things to prosper. And who would have ever thought San Francisco would empty out and become a third world cesspool? with drug dealers and feces and needles on the streets of what was once one of America's crown gems. But when perversion administrates through liberal progressive politics, you lose your prosperity. So compare it again to Tulsa, if you've ever been to Tulsa. Again, it has its problems, but it's beautifully manicured, beautifully landscaped, lots of prosperity there, healthy middle class there. You can feel the presence of God. This is why we pray for our leaders. We pray for city council, county commission. Pray for your police. Pray the judgment of God on all of it so corruption is exposed. Because when you do it, righteousness and prosperity prevails and people are saved a lot easier. Try to go evangelize in San Francisco today. Try to go evangelize in Tulsa today. Some places are easy, some places are hard, and the reason is spiritual. Okay. For there's one God, verse 5, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for how many? Four times the word all is used here. All, 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 all. So I think the point is God loves everybody. He wants to save everybody. He wants to help everybody. And he's looking for us to be the avenue with which he does it. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified and do time whereunto I am ordained a preacher. So Paul now switches it up. He's talking about his calling. Whereunto, whereunto the gospel, whereunto the ministry of reconciliation. Paul was ordained a preacher. So we have three callings here. A preacher, an apostle. Skip the parenthetical and it says a teacher. A preacher, an apostle, a teacher. Apostles are preachers and teachers, but not all preachers are apostles. Not all preachers are teachers. Not all teachers are apostles. You see kind of the overlap here. Paul was an apostolic man. That's more of a work than it is a, de a deliverance style, a delivering message style. But he was a preacher, and he was a teacher to the Gentiles, but as an apostle who started churches. Evangelists are teachers and preachers. Teachers are teachers, but they're not preachers. So you see a threefold calling here on Paul. We also know he's called a prophet at one point. So you see a very diverse calling here. That's not to say you should go fabricate multiple levels of calling. How about just be happy where you're at? We have a friend who fancies himself an apostle, but he's like, shh, don't tell everybody. It hasn't manifested yet. Well, if you got to keep it a secret, I'm going to just not tell anybody about it. But you can even see in our charismatic circles, there's a hierarchy. It's like the apostles, the fourth degree black belt. That pastor, that's just a little white belt with a little yellow stripe. I'm beyond that. God has promoted me to the level of prophet. That's like a green belt with a brown stripe. I'm about to be a fourth degree prophet. And then, you know, here in the next year or two, the Lord said to me on one of my trips to heaven, um, he's going <laughs> to promote me to fourth degree apostolic black belt. And then I'll come in the fullness of my mission. You sound like every prophecy you ever heard coming through the holy men of God 50 years ago. What this says is that you're horribly insecure. Why not just be content with where God called you to be? If you have to tell people what you are, if you have to put it on your business card, you're probably not it. Just be whatever God calls you to be. Amen. I don't, again, getting to work with the police has been a blessing. They never introduce themselves with their rank. They never correct you because the officers I get to work with, are, they're, they're basically servants. I'm having to learn what little things on the collars represent. I never tell them, I'm a, my name's Pastor Chris. I just say, I'm Chris. I, I pastor one of our local churches. And if they just call me Chris, 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 preacher, reverend, or chaplain, I don't correct them, whatever. How come we in our circles, 
our business cards and our placards have to have like 15 titles. It's vanity. How about just be servant? Just be a servant. And if people want to call you something, hey, that's it. But if you got to say, well, it just hasn't come in the mail yet, then it probably isn't going to ever come in the mail yet. <laughs> I'm ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Verse 8. And this is good, and it's about to change things up, so let's hear this carefully. Let's look at this in the New Living Translation. Uh, Josh, verse 8. I'm in chapter 2. Come on. My phone app is not wanting to work. Verse 8. In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. Uh, other translations say disputation or strife. So Paul's about to go from praying for everybody outside the church to now he's about to teach how he wants men in the church at Ephesus to behave. And he says, I want men in the church to pray lifting their hands. So this is why we do it. We have a commandment. We want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God. And I believe that's both literal and metaphorical. Holy hands, not dirty hands. Not just lifting up holy hands, but literally. That we have clean hands and clean heart. But it uses two words to describe the common sin of men's heart. And that is anger or wrath and controversy and strife. That's an assignment for every man. That's what we aim for. Holy hands, which means physical sin, purged, and then the sins of our heart. Anger, controversy, disputation, dispute, strife. Because what he's about to do after this is say, likewise, women. And then he's about to tell women how they need to adjust their whole lifestyle. So he's really ballparking the common sins of men. Make sure, men, that your hands aren't swift to shed blood or to do dirty things or to pick up a beer or look at porn or steal. Holy hands, clean lifestyle, basically. And then make sure your heart isn't full of this anger and resentment and that you don't let that get into strife and disputation. Because men, men get belligerent. They get offended. They go quiet. They yell. I don't know women can do it too, but that's not really the aggressiveness that men do, uh, that, that women are known for dealing with. It's what men have to chase and deal with. So you men, you, you just write those three things down. Clean lifestyle, a heart of love, not anger, and a heart of peace, not strife, which means you don't get to hold offenses. And if you lift your holy hands, you won't have them around your neighbor's throat or with a fist clenched, shaking it at them. Holy hands, clean hands, pure heart. Verse 9 switches it up and says concerning ladies, and I want women to be modest in their appearance. Uh, men, you don't really have to tra tell, don't dress like a floozy. This isn't San Francisco after all. You don't have to worry about men coming to work, uh, work details with shorts too short. You don't have to deal with men dressing too scantily. Now, there are a couple of our college guys that insist on buying Baby Gaps mediums because they're, they're, they're proud of their imaginary muscles. I mean, they're basically free base and creatine, and it ain't helping a bit. But, you know, I like to tell them, hey, look at that. It's like a real muscle, just smaller. Hey, did you get that shirt from my son, Justice? He has the same shirt, just about as small, too. There might be that youthful lust. But he says, I want women to be modest in their appearance. We're looking at New Living Translation. That's always been an issue for women. Modest. King James says, uh, women adorn themselves in modest apparel because there's really no other way to define it. Modest. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing. Dr. Barclay says, don't show off your ski slopes. And we all know what he means when he says ski slopes. I used to call it your plumber's crack. We don't want to see your plumber's crack. <laughs> Even my girl's like, Mommy, <laughs> we were at the mall or we were at wherever. That woman had so much crack hanging out. 
she, and they always say, when I get bigger, I'm not showing my crack like that. And I just, all I hear is like a plumber, crack, crack, that's funny. His crack's hanging out, that's funny. <laughs> you have to deal with young ladies. Cover up what you got, because guys like it. And we don't, this isn't a meat market. This is a house of God. Amen. And some of you still come with dresses way too short. Some, even, even like Sunday, some of you, you sit down and you don't realize it. I just about can see the bottom of your buttocks. I'm not looking. I don't need to look. Don't want to look. To be honest, I need stronger glasses. <laughs> and that helps me when some of you decide to wear like a summer dress that really is hardly a swimsuit cover. And you know what I'm talking about. Just because you stand up and it comes to your fingertips doesn't mean if you bend over or sit down, it doesn't show your duty. And I wish some of you parents would help your kids not show everybody what they got. Have some self-respect. Amen. It's the house of God. And I don't think anybody in our church is really lustful. I don't, I don't perceive that. It's just kind of like ignorance or flippancy. Or maybe you do like the attention you think you're getting. But the Bible says, let the women be modest in their appearance. Leave something to the imagination. I, I taught a youth purity conference 10 years ago, and I said, this is my judgment as a pastor and a dad. Uh, take it or leave it. It offends people sometimes. It's possible to find clothing that's not form-fitting. But, you know, if your shirt's so tight, we know right where your boob stops. A little snug. Little, little snug. If we know right where the bottom of that cup is, you chose that shirt on purpose to accentuate the positive. And you violate Paul's teaching. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves. So that's really the heart of it. Don't draw attention to yourselves. We're not here to draw attention to ourselves, nor should you be drawing attention to yourself on the job. Dress respectably. You know, dress like a professional, but don't draw attention to yourselves. Well, this is the man's responsibility. He shouldn't be looking at me. Honey, you know what you are doing. I, I, I'm, I'm so over the whole feminist. That's the man's responsibility. Well, why don't you take a little bit of ownership too? You know what you're doing. Men don't get boob jobs. Women do. Because they want attention. Because they know how to set the bait. Well, they should take responsibility. You know what you're doing. This is as old as time is. Don't let them draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothing. The commentaries comment on this was a very Ephesian thing, that this was uh, the plating of their hair. They were uh, bedeck it with pearls. Why pearls? There's nothing wrong with pearls. The Bible talks about the pearl of great price. Pearl is one of God's creations. We have pearly gates. Pearls aren't the problem, but the cultural pride is being addressed here. Or expensive clothes. Uh, you know, nobody cares about the tag in the back of your shirt at all. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the good things they do. That's what should be the emphasis. You can cross-reference this with 1 Peter 3 and see how it's the uh, inward adorning that's of importance to God, the quiet and meek spirit. So here, if we combine Timothy with Peter, we see what God's looking for is a, a beautiful heart and a beautiful work ethic for God. And everything in between, which is basically the flesh, hey, that's great too, but that's not what you are. So in a sense, the Bible agrees. Narcissism is bad. And you're not a piece of meat. The Bible agrees. And you shouldn't sell yourself like it's a meat market. The Bible agrees. I want to be respected for my personality. Well, then get one. <laughs> you know, there's a lot more to me than just boobs. Well, you're not selling that. You're leading with your best asset. Maybe your only asset. <laughs> All right. <laughs> For women who claim, now if you don't claim to be devoted, then don't worry about it. You're just carnal. 
But for women who claim to be devoted to God, they should make themselves attractive by good things they do. Look beautiful. And I appreciate it. This church honors God. We wear our best. It's Wednesday night. We're a little bit more casual on Wednesday night. But you should be devoted to God and let it be shown by your good works for him. Dress up nice. We're not against pearls. We're not against earrings. I know our United Pentecostal brothers are, you know, they let their women look like B. Arthur and, and our Aunt B. while the men look as dapper Dan as, you know, some Italian sports star. I think that's hypocritical. Mama stuck in the 1920s and here you are dressing like you came out of Milan. I feel like that's hypocritical. Besides every time, oh, by the time those women are all 40, they all look the same. I don't feel like that's God. I don't even know how they know which one's their wife after a service. <laughs> and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Every one of those women is gray by the time they're 40, and you can't tell them apart from behind because they're about yay wide, and they're wearing 90 yards of fabric, all denim. God is not against you looking pretty. And I want my wife to look pretty. Denim is good in moderation. <laughs> Amen. And one of my dear friends is a UPC pastor, and we haven't had this debate yet, but it's coming. It's, it's coming. Like, you get to drive that gorgeous, gorgeous SUV, and it looks like your wife drives a covered wagon. <laughs> and when I was at Dr. Sumrall's, one of my professors called it ankle porn because, you know, they're just so covered up. You just see a little bit of ankle, you get turned on. I had never heard that term before, but you could tell he was speaking from experience. Who doggy? Maybe that's why they wore those boots up to their knees with a thousand laces on it. That's why they were late to church. It took an hour to lace up a boot. Just as many laces in the back of that girdle. All right, we should keep reading because I want to finish this chapter before we go home. All right. Verse 11, women should learn quietly and submissively. And this is the one where we could get into a mess of trouble. And I don't have a lot of time left to deal with all this. Um, but yes and amen. Yeah. No, I'm just... <laughs> uh, women should learn quiet and submissively. <clears throat> I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly. Uh, King James says, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Um, verse 10 goes from, verse 9 and 10, 11, they, they, 9 and 10, they go from women in the plural, King James. Verse 11 jumps to woman in the singular, dealing with now women in general and now a woman in specific. A lot of the interpretation for this goes back to a woman. The term for woman in the Greek is also the term for wife. They're interchangeable. They're synony it's the same word. The contextual clue gives us whether it's a wife or um, just a woman in general. Let the woman be in subjection. Verse 12, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. We cannot take this one verse out of context and say women should come in here as mutes. We have to compare this with other scriptures. Paul does go on to say in Corinthians, doesn't even the law say that women should be quiet? Okay, then Paul explained to me Deborah who God endorsed and God anointed. She even prophesied. It's called the Song of Deborah. And she says, when the Lord raised me up and anointed me, a mother. Don't mothers have authority? Don't they do some teaching? So we have to be very careful. This is a term where I would say the hard line, hard line um, complementarianists who say women should have no place in the local church. It's one of their scriptures they draw upon. So again, we build doctrine theologically. That is, we look at all scriptures on the subject and we gather all the data points to have a full data set before we start executing judgment. So if this says women shouldn't speak at all and they should learn quietly in subjection and sub silence, then what about prophetesses, of which the Bible has some in the New Testament? What do prophetesses do? Do they only prophesy to women? Who did Miriam prophesy to when she took a tambourine and danced in front of the whole nation? How about the prophetesses? There's about seven major prophetesses of the Old Testament who steered kings, who gave wisdom to Saul, who helped the other prophets. What about these? We have to look at this as a, in a giant context. So one of the contexts is we're dealing with a marriage here. So let's read it maybe in terms of marriage. 
I suffer not a wife to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, or we might add her man, but to be in silence. Does that mean a woman can't ever talk? Is the context the local church? Now, thankfully, we have a hermeneutic called historical and cultural, where if we have insight, it might bring a whole lot of clarity. So you're dealing with Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey. There's a similar problem in Corinth. And what history, church history, and culture teaches us is that in those days, women sat on one side of the church and men sat on the other. That still happens in many churches around the world today. I've seen those churches in Africa where women sit on one side and men sit on the other. And you can imagine if there's a teaching going on and there's questions being asked, and let's say Pastor Caleb's here and Miss Tiffany's over here, and there's a discourse going on. Like, I've learned this about women. They're horrible at whispering. <laughs> horrible. The best way for a woman to whisper is to be silent. <laughs> to that, I will agree. But let's just say, you, you know, Tiffany says, honey, what's he saying? What's, where's that verse at? That can become a disruption. Yeah. Learn in silence. Corinthians says, let him ask questions later. So I, I want, you know, we have no problem at all with women who are anointed of God to share. If they're not to teach, well then how did Solomon get Psalm, Proverbs 31? His mama taught him the word of God. How about Song of Solomon when every other refrain is the Shunammite woman declaring scripture? So am I technically a woman when I speak the words of a woman that were inspired of God to be written down? What about when I read the song of Miriam or the song of Deborah, am I giving voice to a woman? Really good questions to ask. Uh, let them learn quietly. So that is, let's not have disruptions. Forgotten. Now Paul goes and he defends his explanation here, and we know it ties back to marriage because his proof text, which is Genesis creation. For God made Adam first, and afterward he made Eve. So now we know the application is marriage. So the wife does not have authority over her husband. So she doesn't usurp his authority, which is a common doctrine built throughout the entire New Testament. Ephesians fortifies it. Colossians fortifies it. Uh, 1 Corinthians fortifies it. This passage fortifies it. We know that the head of every woman or wife is her husband. I'm not the head of Tiffany. I'm not the head of Jenna. I'm not the head of Ariel. I'm not the head of Holly unless in a pastoral role. I'm the head of my wife and I'm the head of a church. But the head of every wife is her husband. Let me, let me throw you another theological debate that's out there. Um, the word, I should know the word. I wrote it down uh, kephale, I believe is what it is. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Kephale head. That's first Corinthians 11, three, which says the head of every woman is the man. The head of every man is Christ and the head of Christ is God. The word kephale is head there. Some of the compliment, uh, egalitarianistic doctrine. Egalitarian means we think we see everybody equal and that there's no subordinationism in the body of Christ because we're all equal, which is lunacy. Uh, you don't even have that in a home or in a classroom, or anywhere in the world, except for hippie commune. And even then, some alpha dog always rises to the top because it's natural. So one of the arguments that goes all the way back, probably post-feminism, is when theologians started trying to take kephale, the Greek word, and say that it meant source, that metaphorically it could mean source. So the source of Christ is God. The source of man is Christ, and the source of woman is the man. And that removed any kind of authority, any kind of economic subordinationism, because they were trying to prove uh, that this word doesn't mean head or in charge of or over. I actually just read this argument last week on a Christian website. And they were trying to debunk all the leadership of the local husband. And they were using the same argument. It was brilliantly debunked in 85 by a theologian. And he was a very a smart theologian. He went back and looked at over 2,000 uses of kephale in, in Greek culture. And never once was it ever used metaphorically to mean source. It always meant head and leader. So you, you, just like you have woke, stupid academics in secular knowledge, you have woke, stupid academics in theology who will pervert truth to push an agenda that they borrowed from the secularist. 
So now that Paul's using our source text as the creation of the first husband and the first wife, we can dial this back into marriage. And I don't have a problem. We don't have, again, this, this could be a whole month of studies here, but we're just trying to exegete through Timothy that this is another passage where Paul says, listen, I want to remind you, husbands are in charge. That doesn't mean they can do anything they want. If nothing else, it puts tremendous burden of responsibility on the husband to not fail. When the boss promotes you on the job, you do everything you can to not fail. Because you know if you fail, demotion and layoff could happen. We seem to think I can fail and my wife will pick up the slack. Most Jezebels exist because the husband is an Ahab. And you Ahabs, because we have a couple of them here tonight, you're destroying your wife. She doesn't want to be a Jezebel, but she knows you're so lazy that if she doesn't pick up your slack, she'll lose the family. And sometimes she's okay with that because she's over you. There would have never been a Jezebel had there not been an Ahab. Ahab was spineless. He was lazy. He was a coward. He was fearful. He was emotional. And his lack of leadership allowed Jezebel to come into her own and kill many innocent people. I wonder if that woman could have been something better if she'd had a leader. Maybe. Maybe she could have been converted. As it is, everybody she ever loved went to hell. And we blame Ahab because he was made first. So read this verse again, verse 13. For God made Adam first and afterward he made Eve. That's his reason for saying women should learn quietly and submissively. I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. The context is marriage. The greater emphasis is have authority over them. And it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived and sin was the result. And so we, we see that this is one of the reasons Again, he's calling back the book of Genesis. One of the reasons we, or he doesn't want the woman to teach the man is that in the beginning, and this is going to get a little murky for you, Adam walked with God. God spoke to Adam. This is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of it. The moment you eat of it, you will surely die. It was then Adam's job to teach Eve that. And apparently he didn't do such a hot job because the first time she was tested on that Sunday school lesson. And Satan says, what do you know about this tree? She says, well, we can't touch it. So either she didn't listen well, which I don't think that's the case because women are really good listeners and they remember everything. <laughs> when it suits them. It's good preaching, pastor. Yes, I know. <laughs> Fixing everybody. All two genders of us. <laughs> Either she didn't listen, which I don't think was the case, or Paul, uh, uh, Adam failed to teach accurately. Right. It was his responsibility to disciple his wife. That concept is brought through to the New Testament and to Ephesians 5, where he nurtures and cares for his wife. The word nurture means to train and develop. So she gets tested by Satan, and Satan says, well, you know, what do you know? Look, look at this. You won't surely die. She says, no, we can't touch it. And he convinces her otherwise. And then Adam's there and partakes himself. Adam wasn't deceived. He had good doctrine. He just failed to teach. But the point of the woman not teaching is she usually doesn't have the doctrine the man is supposed to have. Is it always that way today? No. Unfortunately, for the last 150 years of American history, women have always been the more spiritual one because men tend to be deadbeat and lazy. All they want is a sandwich or sex. And if they can get both out of their wife, it's a win. And what do they contribute? Little to nothing. And I'm sorry, ladies, that's the condition of mankind today. These verses, to me, don't put the woman down. These verses demand the man come up exponentially, which is also why I'm all about tapping the brakes when you think you're in love. How many divorces can you endure? At what point... Do you just give up altogether? It was not Adam who was deceived by Satan, but it was Eve and the woman being deceived. Sin was the result. Verse 15 is where we'll close. The commentaries I read after say, this is the hardest verse to interpret in the, in the 
probably the New Testament, but definitely the pastoral epistles. But women, or King James says, notwithstanding she, she shall be saved in childbearing. If they, so we go from singular to plural, or she is the all generic women or woman, she shall be saved if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So what? What are you talking about, Paul? I mean, those last four verses, if we could just like skip over them. You're messing up my American woman. There's three interpretations of this last verse, and I don't give you my opinion on any of them. The first interpretation says the she refers to Eve, that Eve could be saved. The word is sozo there, healed, delivered, made whole, salvation, a lot of applications, very broad term. That she is a reference to Eve, that Eve was delivered from her sin by carrying forth children so the lineage of Christ could come through. That's a pretty good interpretation. She continued with God. She had a man child. And through her lineage, through her seed, Jesus Christ came as the first prophecy of the Bible declared would happen and salvation happens. Oh, I'm okay with that. Another interpretation says it's a reference prophetically in retrospect of Mary. She brought forth the Christ child and was saved through childbearing. That one to me is a little, was a bit of a stretch. Yeah, you know, it might fit. The third one I think perhaps works the best because it seems to hearken both to Genesis as Paul seems to be doing in this passage, quoting about Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, and Eve getting in sin and the Lord saying, now in your childbirth there'll be pain. And if we apply sozo, and use the, terp, uh, the definition as, or the, uh, the translation as healed, you could read it, notwithstanding, she shall be healed in childbearing. Women, women, all women, because women bear children, and childbirth is promised to be painful because of Eve's fall in the beginning, Genesis chapter 3. You shall bring forth children with pain. That notwithstanding, she shall be healed or delivered in childbearing if she continue in faith and charity with holiness and sobriety. You apply your faith and childbearing will be easier. That's the third interpretation. That one I like a lot. Because if you go back to Genesis and you're just chewing on it, and that's fine. Genesis chapter 3, and the Lord says, uh, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. So because Paul is quoting Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, she's in the transgression. This is the first curse Eve receives upon transgression. And now this verse solves that transgression. The woman will be healed, delivered, made whole, and childbearing assuming she continues to live in faith, love, holiness, and modesty. And I think we could easily understand how many Christian women have used this verse and others like it to believe God for healthy childbearing. This is one of the passages when we began having children that my wife stood on when she was reading Supernatural Childbirth by uh, Mises, Terry Mises' wife. Um, doesn't matter. And the author pointed out that the same word sorrow in Genesis is the same word from Isaiah 51 that he himself bore our pain in our sorrows. And so that if you have faith and can hear it, that it is possible to apply your faith so that your childbearing has a sorrow borne by the Lord Jesus so that it is easy. Now, I will never be able to test that because I was born a man, grew up as a man, decided to stay as a man, and we'll never know what childbirth is. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> but I can tell you, my wife's personal testimony is every kid seemed to get bigger and every delivery got faster. And her testimony, not to condemn anybody else's, because my, my, I'm kind of more uh, simplistic. Just get that kid here and let's go on. That's, that's me. That's like, whatever, epidural, hey, C-section, whoa, whatever. Just get it here. Let's get it healthy. Let's get on the road. My wife was more faith focused, and so she never had an epidural. And Lydia took 45 minutes of pushing, Abzi took 15 minutes of pushing, and Bud Bud, she pushed once. And Bud was a nine pound baby, and ba-doom. And we conceived Bud, 
a month after my wife nearly died when we lost the ectopic pregnancy. So my wife has really developed a tremendous faith for this. And this verse would follow under that. You could insert yourself, I'm a woman and I'll be healed and delivered in childbearing because I continue in faith and love and holiness and modesty, which are all subjects of that chapter. Amen. So set your faith now. But let me also add this. If you have to have an epidural, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, praise God, amen, stick me. If you need a C-section, get the baby here. Get the baby here. Don't beat yourself up for needing medical help. It's okay to go to the hospital. It, it's okay. I mean, if you want to home birth it and mess up that bathtub, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> I did see a guy talk about, yeah, we did home delivery. Yeah, and there's blood here, and there's blood here, and there's blood here, and the dog's wallering there. <laughs> yeah. All right. That ends chapter two, which I means I'm accomplishing what I want, which is one chapter of Wednesday night. You learn anything? Is this encouraging you? Can you hear Paul's heart talking to a pastor about how this works behind the scenes? We do talk about people. We do name names. We keep the church clean. We think about people we've lost and who we've lost and people we've seen suffer definitely affects how we pastor and encourage because if someone we love failed, you could too. And you have to know that in all of a pastor's wisdom, exhortation, counsel, rebukes is all the experience and pain that he carries with them. And so you'd be wise to listen to someone who God is endorsing and say, I maybe don't understand everything they're saying, but it's coming from somewhere. And you have every right to ask for clarity. Why are you so hard on this, Pastor? Let me say this, because this will upset a few of you, and I like to do that, kind of. I've never been more resisted by you guys than on the whole social media thing. It's the one thing I've been gossiped about, slandered about, and you've had conversations about me in your home. And that's fine. But we're now 13 years into smartphones and smart devices. So we now have a whole generation of my friend's kids being raised without my personal stance. And I'm watching my preacher friend's kids go to the world. I have a preacher friend whose daughter went to prom in a tuxedo. And when I first met them, she was three, maybe four. But you know what she has in common? It's right here. So there's always more secret ingredients to the wisdom than you may want to care to admit. I don't believe I'm done watching my preacher friends lose their kids. And all I can do is pray and say, man, now my battery pack is back. It's wonderful. Huh. But there's always so much more going on when the pastor or the apostle or the mentor is making statements of advice, just like you do as a parent. When you tell your kids, don't jump off that countertop, there's a lot of reasons why you make that statement. and you have to hope they trust you. Amen. Amen. I, th I think it's pretty common sense with parenting. There's a time we have to say, just trust me, and there's a time you say, when we have time, we'll discuss why I don't want you doing that. But hopefully you're seeing, as we teach on these pastoral epistles, the heart of the pastor and why he does and says things, and you see Paul talking to this young pastor to help his best church stay good. Yeah. Now, it failed because Ephesus doesn't exist anymore. And it didn't 100 years after that epistle. How does the Apostle Paul build a church so great it ceases to exist in less than 100 years? We as Americans have churches older than that. But Paul's church petered out. Amen. Father, thank you for helping us. We thank you for the pastoral epistles. We thank you, Lord, for showing us how pastors think and reveal to us your heart as the good shepherd 
We ask you, Lord, to keep us close to you. May we extract wisdom. May we extract, extract truth from these teachings. I ask you to help me, Lord, teach what I've learned and what I've gained over the years as a pastor. Help me, Lord, to help your people through these lessons. May you be glorified in them. May our lives be strengthened in them. And may our families come up. May our children come up. May this church come up as we do things biblically. I thank you for blessing our study tonight. Pray this with me, church. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the local flock. Thank you for our local shepherd. Thank you for the elders, our sheepdogs. We call the pastor anointed. We call the elders anointed. Help us, Lord, to run our race, finish our course, and glorify your name. I call myself hungry for your word and thirsty for your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.